the church have not understood certain things and that is why it makes it difficult for many to accept who really the Christian is. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Christian, the Gentile, who became a Christian was never under the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You have not been under the law. So for you, the Gentile is not a new testament or a new covenant for you. It is a new covenant for the Jew after the flesh. Because he had a covenant with Jehovah. So when he gives his life to Jesus and become part of the covenant that the master established in his blood, he becomes a new covenant. Because there was an ode to him. By you, the Christian, who is a Gentile, who was part of the nations, and became born again, is not a new covenant. It becomes the first covenant that you have become part of. Amen. Mm -hmm. So the Bible in Ephesians, talking about the Gentile, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that they were estranged from the commonwealth of Israel. They were estranged from God's covenant of promise. Says that they were godless without God in the world. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, Israel as a nation had a covenant with Jehovah, a blood covenant. And a blood covenant is the most binding of all covenants. It's the most binding of all covenants. Because the Bible says that that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So a blood covenant is the strongest of all covenants. Now that covenant brings benefits. But when you break that covenant to, it brings havoc and destruction. So God made a covenant with Israel. So Israel was God's covenant partner. And because they were God's covenant partner, God had to protect them and defend them. So whenever Israel was in trouble, attacked by any enemies of theirs, Jehovah had to stand in for Israel. Because Jehovah had become their covenant partner. Amen. And every covenant has terms. For instance, there is a marriage covenant. And that marriage covenant has terms. So that covenant tells you what you can do, what you cannot do. And that is why when you, you marry a man, then the Bible says, let you know that that covenant means that your body belongs to him. And also his body belongs to you. When you infringe on that promise of the covenant, you are breaking that covenant. So the same way to covenant has, it's like a contract, and it has terms, amen. If you obey your part of the covenant, your covenant partner ought to obey his part. But God obeyed his part of the covenant, but Israel didn't obey. Now when God, because of that covenant, God will always attack the nations of the world for the sake of the Israelites. So when uh, any nations attack them, God will fight for them. Sometimes he will send angels to even to, uh, to battle on behalf of Israelites. He sent chariots of fire. Not because Israel were without sin or the whole nation of Israel were righteous. And that's why God will tell them in Deuteronomy that you are as wicked as the other nations. All the evil things that they do, you also, you do some of these things. So I don't defend you because you are better than them. I am driving them out of the nation, out of the land because of the love that I have for you. Because you are my covenant people. Amen. Amen. But because they also broke the covenant that they had with Jehovah, they also have been one of the na uh, nations of this world who have suffered so extremely throughout the history of creation. Mm -hmm. 
And this, all what I've said is to bring you to a certain point. So let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Because as we look at eschatology, you have to understand certain things, so it helps you. Let's go to verse 6. Now let's start from the verse 5. So God, through Moses, told the Israelites, It is now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So this one it was conditional. If dictates condition. So it says, if you obey my voice, God says that if you obey my voice and my commandments, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. You shall be unto me a holy nation. This was God's word, packed with them, but they failed. They couldn't obey. And because of that, that let's go to Romans chapter 9. So when Paul talks about the fact that the adoption pertained to Israel, the Israelites, that's what he was talking about. The adoption pertained to the nation of Israel. And it's very important for Christians to understand the gospel from this angle. And when you understand the gospel from this angle, then you understand why the Christian, your life is tied to Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. Because, and that's why Jesus said that to the Samaritan woman, that salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. It says, who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption and the glory? And the covenant. So the adoption and the glory pertain to Israel. God said, Obey my commandments and covenants, then you shall what? be a kingdom of priests to me. He was talking about the Mechasidic order. Because the Mechasidic order is about kingdom of priests. So he says that if you want the order of Mechasidic to be established with you, then obey my what my covenants amen now let's go to first epistle of peter chapter 2 verse 9 it says but ye are a chosen generation now when you read the exodus it says that if so they were not a holy nation you are not a kingdom of priests but here it says, he doesn't say if. Talking about a Christian. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's a royal means king priest. You are what? He's talking about the Mechasidic order. He says that ye are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what they couldn't achieve through the law, was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Christ, Jesus, was the only Jew who was able to fulfill that covenant. You see, Jesus lived under the old covenant. He fulfilled the old covenant. And therefore, what God would give to the Jew who fulfilled that, he gave it to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave it to Jesus. So Jesus, that's what Jesus called the son of David. Amen. Amen. So Jesus now established the Mechasidic order and he brought the rest of us in. And that's what Christianity is about. So Christianity is that you have been born again into the Mechasidic order. Amen. Amen. But this pertains to what? To the Jews after the flesh. They couldn't attain to it till the Messiah came. Now, because they broke the covenant of God, God said throughout the years, told his prophets to talk to them. So let's read the book of Jeremiah. 
chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. Now, when Jesus came, Israel as a nation rejected the Messiah. So the master said to Je cried and said to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, ye that killed the prophets. Says, how I wish, how it was my desire to gather your children like a hen, gather his chicks, but you will not allow me. In Mark chapter 23, he talks about it. He says that because of this, your land is left to you desolate. Amen. So they rejected the Messiah. And because of that, it means that the desolation ought to continue. You understand that as you read this. Let's go, let's start from the verse 1. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Joachim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of the book of Nazar, king of Babylon. The way Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the thirtieth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twenty-three years, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. So the Hebrew writer says that God spoke to the fathers by the law and the prophets. Amen. So he spoke to them by the prophets. He says that sending them by ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn ye again now everyone from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord had given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, said the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own head. Therefore, that said the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words. Now, when you read Ezra chapter 19, it says that if you obey my commandments, if you obey my commandments, you shall be what kingdom of priests unto me. So here the Lord says, Therefore, that said the Lord of hosts, because he have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, said the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations run about. And will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and unhasten and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of men and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the milestones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. So this was the prophecy through Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah. God says that because you have been disobedient to the pact, to the contract, you are going to what? Be in captivity for 70 years. Why would they be in captivity for 70 years? It's because, because of the covenant, God had punished the nations for the sake of Israel. Amen. And Israel went to do the same thing that the nations were doing. Because when God was driving the nations, when, uh, for instance, God told Abraham that your children, your, your seed will be in captivity in Egypt. And after the four, in the fourth generation, I'll bring them out of Egypt. And God says that why? Because he says that the transgressions of the Amorites, the Amorites were the people who were inhabiting the land of Canaan at that time. He says that the transgression has not been completed. You see why? God let us know that God is a patient God. It's not that when you sin, then he strikes you. So he gives you a period of mercy to change. 
And because they will not change, it says that when their transgression becomes full in the fourth generation, I'll bring Israel out to what? To give them the land of the Amorites. These Amorites, why was God driving them out of the land? Because they are worshipping idols. They were in all kinds of evil, fornication, all kinds of, of moral decadence. So God says that I'm driving them out because of this wickedness. Now, Israel, who are God's people, now went about doing the same thing that the Gentile nations were doing. So then God had to be righteous. God is a judge, and a judge ought to be righteous. Because God is no respecter of persons. So if because you are my people, the reason why you became my people is because of the covenant, because of the pact. And because of that covenant, now I can stand on your behalf and fight the nations for you. And the stipulation of the covenant is that you should not what do the same things that the nations are doing. But now, after I have fought for you, after I have delivered you from the hands of your enemies, you went about doing the same thing that they were doing. Therefore, for God, the righteous God, to be just, then God also has to give you into captivity of, to, of that nation. And that's why God said that. And God says that that captivity, the desolations of Jerusalem will be for what? 70 years. Amen. Amen. Will be for 70 years. Now let's go to the book of Daniel chapter 9. So, Jeremiah wrote this in the book. All the prophecies of those times, they write it in the book. So, the captivity happened as Jeremiah prophesied. And that is what brought Daniel into the land of Babylon. So, many other Jews of the kingdom of Judah were brought into what? The Babylonian kingdom, the kingdom of the Chaldeans. So the Bible says that in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now at this time, the Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom has been overthrown by the kingdom of Persia. So the Bible says that but still, at that time, still, the Jews were in what? In that kingdom. So say, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to what? Jeremiah the prophet. Mm -hmm. So Daniel went to read the book of Jeremiah, the prophecies of Jeremiah, mm -hmm. that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of what? Of Jerusalem. So God has prophesied that I will complete what? 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now let's go to Luke chapter. We'll come back here, but let's go to Luke chapter 21 from verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem, so now the master is talking. Say, when you shall see Jerusalem compass with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child. And to them, you see that's why he calls it the days of vengeance. The days of vengeance. Vengeance of who? Vengeance of the nations. So it says that, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon these people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It says, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So this ought to happen till the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Then Jerusalem will come out of that desolation. Let's go back to the Jeremiah. Sorry that we are in Daniel, right? 
Yeah, Daniel 9. See, and I set my face. So Daniel, when he read this prophecy, he says that uh, he set his face to pray. Why did Daniel do that? Because at this time, Daniel has been 66 years in the kingdom of Babylon, which now has been taken over by the Persian kingdom. So to Daniel, he took the years literally. You remember when you read Jeremiah chapter 25, it said that 70 years should be accomplished in the, what, in the desolations. So Daniel know that uh, I'm 66 years now in captivity. So left with what, four years. So when he read the book of Jeremiah, he started praying because he knew that our deliverance is near. Amen. So the Lord said, and I said, Daniel said, and I said my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which speak in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faith to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he said before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Now if you remember, what is Daniel talking about? When you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, last time when you went through the curses, one of the curses was, if you sin against me, you go into captivity. So that is what Daniel is talking about. That in the law of Moses, God has said that to them that the curse, he said that now the curse is poured up upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because you have sinned against him. And he had confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil, for under the whole heaven had not been done as had been done upon Jerusalem. And that's why I said that Israel has been one of the, the they have suffered the most in the world. You talk about the Holocaust which happened in, what, in Nazi Germany under Hitler. It's because of all this deviation from the covenant of God. It's because of that. Because they disobeyed their part of the contract. See, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore had the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth, for we obey not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renowned, as that at that this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thy anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Now, one thing you also have to learn from this is that, even though Daniel knew that it was a prophecy, he didn't say that I'm just sleeping for the prophecy to come to pass. In his mind, he knew that, oh, it's four years for, for, for the prophecy to come to, uh, to pass. But he was praying. You know, some Christians, when they get a prophecy, they go and sleep. Oh, God has given me a prophecy to come to pass. No. You have to what? You have to pray. You have to pray. Amen. 
So he prayed. Daniel knew what to do. He says, Oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thy anger and thy fury be turned away from thy, thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O oh our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate. For the Lord's sake. So at this time, the temple in Jerusalem was under desolation. Was under desolation. When they, they attacked Jerusalem, they destroyed Jerusalem and also the temple. They, and they, the Bible even let us know they burned the temple. So it was in this desolation. Then it says, Oh my God, incline thy ear and hear, open thy eyes and behold our desolation and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thy own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, yeah, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel. So now he says that as he was praying with regards to this, the angel Gabriel was sent to him. Amen. Amen. So he says that even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now this is interesting. The man says that I'm praying, and his prayer caused the angel to fly swiftly. So uh, when you are praying, you think nothing is happening, but your prayer caused things in the spiritual realm. Amen. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am not come for to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, at the beginning of thy supplications, so that at the beginning when you began to pray, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. Why? What did the commandment came for at the beginning of Daniel's supplication? He, he says, For thou art greatly beloved. So, because Daniel was greatly beloved, his prayer caused God to send Gabriel. You think Daniel is more loved than you? Is Daniel more loved than you? No. You are in Christ. So, what should your prayer do? So, if Daniel's prayer can cause an angel, can cause God, a commandment to come forth from the throne of God. That angel, Gabriel, go and, 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 and what? Give him what he wants to what? To know. What about a Christian who is in the name of, live in the name of Jesus? And that is why then Jesus said that if you ask anything in my name, he will do it. God will do it. Sometimes it doesn't mean that the answers will come just in a minute. But it will come in God's way and in God's timing. But once you believe, it will come to pass. Because once you pray according to his word, it will work. God will never say no. Amen. Because all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are here. And amen. So he said, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So now at this time, Daniel thought that it was 70 literal years. 70 literal years, but the angel says, no, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish their transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal, seal up their vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. To anoint the most holy means the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Jesus Christ being established in Jerusalem. So it says that 70 weeks are determined for all days to happen. And here he's talking about 70 weeks of years. So 70 weeks of years are what? Are determined from that time to what? Where the commandment went forth to the anointing of Jesus Christ is to be established in Jerusalem. Please, next verse. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore 
and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. So now you multiply this 62 plus 7 gives us 79. Sorry, 69. Then you multiply it by what? By 7. Then gives you the number of years which you are to span from when the commandment go forth for them to rebuild the, the temple in Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, when Jesus Christ was crucified in Jerusalem. So now, if that becomes 69 weeks of years, but God prophesied to, God's prophecy through Jeremiah was 70 weeks of years, meaning that one week of year is missing. Mm -hmm. One week of year is missing. So it says that, no therefore understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven, seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. And that is why, sixty-nine weeks. Mm -hmm. But he said, Jeremiah's prophecy was what? Seventy weeks. Meaning that one week was missing. That one week is what is about eschatology, the end time. So God took that one week from Daniel's day and put it at the end time. And he said that in, for the, the period of these 70 weeks of years, Jerusalem ought to be under desolations and attacks, attacks, continuous attacks from the nations. So when you, you look at the history of Israel, they have been an, in captivity under many kingdoms. It started from Babylon, it went to the uh, Median and Persian Empire, it went to the Grecian Empire, then the Roman Empire came. When Jesus Christ came, Jerusalem was under the reign of Caesar, the Roman Empire. So that is what he's talking about. So now, one week is left for the desolation, and that's when the Antichrist will come in. So that's when the Antichrist comes to, to, to the, uh, Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation. He comes to what? Take Jerusalem captive. And that's where part we fit in. Amen. And that's what eschatology is about. Amen. So now as we are looking at eschatology, we should understand that this one week, this seven years, the last week we are, we are treating, that I said that it starts with what? With a treaty. And in the middle of that seven years is when the abomination of desolation will happen. So that's the last week of Daniel that we are talking about. And that's what it's about, the last week of what? Of Daniel. Amen. Mm -hmm. So please, we understand so far. Mm -hmm. So this is to bring us to the understanding of what is this about. It's what God has prophesied. But now, the final week has to what? Happen. Then everything will come to an end. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, the church, this was the deal. God said that Jerusalem will go into desolations. You go into troublous times because you broke my covenant. But Jesus Christ came and paid for all the sins that. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Because this captivity, this desolation is the curse of the law. When you read, he called it the curse of the law. Daniel called it the curse, which was in the law of what? Of Moses. So when we go to Galatians chapter 3, from verse 10, please. Say, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So now it says that anyone who continues to walk in the law is under the curse. So, Israel as a nation, they are still in the law. They didn't receive the, what, the Messiah. They still are in the law. They believed in the law for their righteousness. And the, the, the provision of the law is that you should be able to obey all uh, the commandments of the law to be, uh, to be righteous. 
and no one could do that. So because of that, they are still under the curse. And that is why they will be in captivity and in captivity till they turn back to the Messiah. Amen. Amen. But it goes on to say, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hanged on a tree. So now the Jew who now will receive Jesus Christ is not supposed to be under the law. Is not supposed to be under the law. Or is not supposed to be under the curse. Because he has been redeemed from the curse. Amen. So the tribulation and the troublous times is not for the church. It is, the desolation is for what? Israel. But on the other side, on the other side, please can you take her out? But on the other side, it is a tribulation for the church. And that is why uh, on Tuesday, we had certain discussions on that when we met for the uh, Bible study. That you have to see that is two sides of the coin. On one side, it is the case that Israel has to be fulfilled in Israel. The, what? The, uh, the 70 years of desolation which should be fulfilled. On the church side, it is a tribulation and uh, a trying of, the, of, of your faith in Jesus Christ. And that is and that's, that's where uh, some ministers find difficulty. And those who preach uh, pre-tribulation rapture, that is their problem because they know, they have understood, they have understood that the church should not be part of these troublous times. So then they believe that they will be raptured before the tribulation. But you have to understand that in as much as in that three uh, and a half years will, will be the trouble of Jacob. In that same great tribulation for the church is a test of your faith. And the Bible says that tribulation count it all joy when you go through diverse temptations. Amen. Diverse tribulations. For what? The trying of your faith. So for you, the Christian, is a trying of your faith. And it work at what? Patience. Mm -hmm. And he says that let patience have its work in you, that you may be what? complete and entire, wanting nothing. So you, it works something good in you. Amen. Because tribulation is a squeezing, and if it squeezes you, it brings the true you, what is within your spirit, the Christ in your spirit will come out. Amen. Now let's go to John chapter 16, verse 33, what the master said. Thirty-three. Says these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. So your peace is based on the things he spoke unto them. Because he says that I have spoken these things to you so that you have peace. So the question you ask yourself is that what things did he say to them? He tells you that in this world you will have tribulations. But I have spoken certain things to you so that you have peace in the midst of what? Of the tribulations. Let's go from the verse 1. It says, These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Ye are the time coming that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known their father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of what? Of them. And these things I said unto you at the beginning because I was with you. So he tells you things so that when the time comes, you will not be offended. And because the church have not understood some of these things, and they think that they will be raptured before the tribulation, they will be offended 
But he says that I'm telling you that they are going to do these things to you. It's not me bringing the tribulation. It's the devil and the nations who will bring you, or, troublous times to you. But when you see these things happening, remember that I told you that they will happen. So that you don't give up and say that, oh, the Lord has de dejected us. And be it's because of this understanding that the first century church, they went through a lot of tribulations. By the way, like Paul says that it is appointed unto us to go to, uh, to, uh, in to be in tribulation. Because they heard what the masters told them. So they knew that it's part of what? Of the Christian work. Even he told uh, Peter that you will get a hundredfold of all the things that you lost. But with what? With persecutions. So he tells you all these things. And also he, James tells us, count it all joy when you go to what? Diverse temptations and tribulations. So all these things is to let you know that it ought to come. It is part of the kingdom. The kingdom work. It is part. And that is what it is about. So first, we have to separate the two. That on the church side, it is tribulation to try your faith. Like uh, John says that here is the what? Is the patience and the faith of the saints. So it's a trying of your faith. Amen. And also the tribulation worked our character. So that is very important. But on the side of the Israelite, it is what? It is a curse. They are suffering. And that is why uh, the, the Antichrist will attack Jerusalem and not any other nation. The Bible says that he will attack Jerusalem. But then also he will persecute. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Verse 17. Let's even start from the 16. It says, and the earth helped the woman. Now, when it says woman, yeah, this woman symbolized the nation of Israel. Amen. So it says that, and the woman, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, with the dragon cast out of his mouth. And what does that mean? It means that when the troublous times of Israel comes, there are certain nations who will help them. And that's why he says that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the flood that the dragon cast upon what? The woman. So there are there be certain nations who will, what, will help them. So he says that, and the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who are these? The church. It's the Christians who have the, uh, the testament, the testimony of what? Of Jesus Christ and the commandments of God. So he's saying that when the dragon will, will attack the nation of Israel, but when he, he doesn't succeed, he will what? He will go after the saints. And that is why in, in Revelation 13, he talks about he made war with the saints, but he prevailed. He prevailed. He will persecute the saints. Amen. Now, let's go to Revelation. Now, this today's sermon was to bring you into what uh, an understanding of why the seven years why the seven years but now let's go to revelations chapter 3 and see something you see as we are concluding the church should be very careful when jesus christ wrote the epistles sorry uh, uh communicated to John that you should write the epistles to the seven churches, the warnings to the seven churches. It was serious because he wanted the church to know that if you don't change, some of you will be part of what is coming. You will be part of what is coming. This teaching of once saved, always saved is from the pit of hell. There's nothing like cause of grace, once saved, always saved is not true. If righteousness is Christianity. Righteousness is a life in Christ. Sin is of the devil. So you can't say that I'm a Christian and because of grace, I'm going to live in sin. It's not acceptable. 
If you choose to walk with Christ, you have to live a righteous life. Amen. Amen. Righteousness is what Christianity is about. Now let's go to chapter 3 from verse 16. What the master said to one of the churches, Laodicean, the Laodicean church. Now before we come here, let's go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 16. Now, this was an epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. He wrote to the church who were at, located at, in Colossae. Then, what did he tell them at the end of his letter to them? He says, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. So, this Laodicean church was a church that was close to the church. At Colossae, this the town of Colossae and, and Laodicea were very close. So he says that after you read my letter, send it also to the church which are at Laodicea to be read unto them. So those seven churches in Revelation chapter 3 were historical churches. They were there. It's not something symbolic. These were Christians living during that time. These churches were there. And that's why Paul lets you know that his letter even ought to be read to the church of what? Of the Laodiceans. So now let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. From verse 16. Let's go to from 14. Says, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. So now Jesus says that write this epistle, this warning to the church at Laodicea, that same church. Says that and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things said the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now let me explain something. When he says the beginning of the creation, he doesn't mean that God, Jesus Christ is the first of God's creation. He is talking about that Jesus is the origin of God's creation. The Bible says that all things were made by the word, and without the word there was not anything made. So not beginning that he was the first. But he began the creation. So that's why he says, He is the beginning of God's creation. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor what? Nor hot. Now, this is to Christians, not to unbelievers. When you read the fourth, he says that unto the church. So this is Jesus Christ warning to Christians. He says that I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because that are lukewarm, you know, there are certain Christians in certain churches, uh, when they see some people, say, oh, these people, they are too spiritual. These people, they don't go to these spiritual folks. They are too spiritual. You people are too, why can't you be lukewarm? You are too spiritual. You are too zealous for the things of God. Why are you so, uh, everything about you, Christianity, Christianity, every, why? They, they make such statements about some Christians. Those are the Christians that Jesus Christ is talking about. Those Christians who, who call other people lukewarm, uh, spiritual, and then they, they think that it can, it's good to be lukewarm. So it says that, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit thee out of my mouth. It means he says you are disgusting. So he says you are disgusting, so I will vomit you out of my mouth. So to the Lord Jesus, if you are lukewarm, you are disgusting to him. So that uh, thinking, they have thought that they have that, oh, if you are in the middle ground, it's acceptable. Jesus says it's not acceptable. He says that if you are not zealous and you are lukewarm, you are disgusting to me. So he says that because thou, say, because thou says, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Please, next verse. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. What does it say to them? Be what? 
So why was, were they disgusting to him? They were not zealous. So it means that the Lord Jesus, once you are a Christian and you are not zealous, you are disgusting. It doesn't matter what they have assumed in their churches about the grace message. That's just the words of the master himself. He says that if you are not zealous and you just go lukewarm, you are disgusting. So he tells them, as many as I love, I rebuke and trust him. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He says, if, and it says that if you are not zealous, I'll do what? I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'll vomit you out. Because this is what he told them. He says that don't be lukewarm. I'll vomit you out. And then he tells them, be zealous. So if you are not zealous, he will vomit you out. You are disgusting to him. Please, next verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, you see, many years ago, you go and preach to people and say to the people uh, in the world, Jesus stands at the door and knocking. It was after some years that I realized that that message was not to unbelievers, it was really to Christians, the churches. He says that, behold, I stand at the door and knock. There are many churches like today being Sunday, they are praising Jesus, but Jesus is not among them. He's at the door. But to them, they say, oh, if two or three gather, there am I in your midst. That's not what he said. He said, if two or three gather in my name, there am I there. In my name. In his gathering his name does not mean mention his name. It means that your gathering should be guarded by his character and authority. Is he the one in authority detecting things, how you do things in the church? He says, if I'm not the one detecting things, I'm at the door. I'm not in. So there are many churches who think that Jesus, like for instance, many churches in this land, last year, the Lord was ministering to me, as I, I said some time ago, that he has left most of them, many of the churches in this land of Sweden. So they meet, and they think that he's there, he's not there. He has not dejected his the children, the church. I'm talking about the church as a church, not the people. But as a church, he has left them. Why? Because he's still at the door. He's, still, he's not in their midst. So they go, they, they play drums, piano, singing. They think that, oh, we are singing and they are even crying. It doesn't mean he's there. It's not about you crying or singing. He tells you that if you meet, you meet in my name. It means that I detect things. Because I'm the boss of the church. So is it my laws, my principles, that is guiding your worship, your way of life, your way of faith? Is it what I told you to do that you are doing it? That's what it means to gather in his name. Like Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, that whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus. So if your Christian work is not guarded by the provisions of the gospel, he's not there. So he's telling the church, you know, he's telling the church, he says, Laodicean church, I'm still at the door knocking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I'm not there because you gathered in my name and you mentioned my name. I'm only there if you are doing the right thing. If you are doing the right thing. So he says that, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in into him and will sup with him and he with me. So Jesus is not just there because you call his name. Have you welcomed him into your home? Have you welcomed him into your life? You see, he is there positionally, but is he there vitally? That he is in you because you are the spirit of Christ in you as a Christian. But there's one thing, he being you, and also experiencing the tangibility of the Lord. And that's why many churches, they don't experience the tangibility of the Lord. Because he's not there, vitally. He's not there. He's still knocking. And why was he knocking? Now, he didn't say this to other, the other churches. For this church, you were lukewarm. So as long as you are not passionate about the purple, why is the church? Why the church? And the church has become a common place. You come to church on Sunday, then you go, you go home. 
Sunday you go home. Sunday you go home. That's all what church is about. Church is about gathering on Sundays and, and going home. You don't have to understand what really the church is supposed to do in this work for the Lord. The Bible says that when, let's go to Psalm 102 verse 16. So till the church understands the reason why they are on this earth and be zealous about the work that the master gave to the church to do, he says that I'm still knocking. But he says that the ones that I love, I, I correct and chastise. So he says, because I love you, repent and I will write. I said, all you have to do, you may be even hearing this message online or you are maybe here. All you have to do is you, you repent. He says, Father, I'm sorry. From today, I'll be zealous about your works. Amen. He says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. When the Lord... Did he say, when Sister Charity will finish the nursing school, I will come in my glory. When Sister Beta will finish the masters, I will come in my glory. Please, that's what he said. He said, when Sister Sylvia, you return back to Uganda, I will come in my glory. Did he say, oh, when you have five children, I'll, then I'll come back in my glory. Did he say, when you are a CEO, then I'll come back in my glory. No. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. So he tells you why you are here. The church is here to build Zion. All the other things he gives us are channels. So as a creative Christian, you see the things you have in this world as channels to fulfill this commandment of building up Zion. Because that's why he has not appeared. And the day that to him Zion is built, he will what? He will appear in his glory. So now he's building Zion. He says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Now, before we end, let's go to, let's use these three minutes to look look at something, another church. Now, for the church, you look at them in debt, but then there are a lot of wonderful things to learn about them. And we look at, at the first, I want us to finish from, next week we'll be continuing from the where we left off, the Revelation chapter 5, and we'll try to finish at the end. Then we'll come back and look at the church and look at certain important things there. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 1. Now this was another church, Sardis. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things said he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name. Now please, let us listen. When the Lord is speaking, you have to listen to every word he says. It's very important. He says that, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou art livest, but, and are dead. What is he saying? There are many Christians and churches who they have a name that they are living, but they are dead. They are pastors who have a name that they are living, but they are dead. There are all kinds of people that have a name that they are living, but they are dead. Jesus says, I know your works. You have a name. Outwardly, people think that you are living. But to me, you are dead. These are the Christians who pretend. They pretend with what? The work of faith. He talks about, oh, when he meets the congregation, he talks about faith. Back home, he or she is crying. When he meets, the, he talks about love, but yet still, he's full of bitterness against people. He says, you have a name, but you are dead. That's what he's saying. They have a name that they live, but are dead. What was the master saying? He says, that let your Christianity be in truth. Let your Christianity be in truth. Amen. That is, be what you are, that people see secretly and openly be the same person. Says that thou hast a name that thou liveth and are dead. Please next verse. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. 
you see what is he saying there are certain things he let us know that a christian you can there are certain things that you can go to a certain level and because of that jesus will say no way again no way again that is you see in the spirit realm they are doors they are doors he says that he is the one who has the keys to the doors for instance to the philadelphia church he says that i open i have the keys of david i open and no one can shut when i shut no one can open so there are certain Christians that they will live certain life in certain areas and the Lord can shut certain doors in their life. It means that those ones, they are dead. So those ones, there's no coming back again. So that's why, and this is the kind of church, you're, Christian you're talking about, the saddest church. It says that, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. So it says that certain things remain. Make sure you strengthen them. The, those which are dead, they are dead. They cannot be what? Rescued again. So we see that, but then be careful that you strengthen those which remain. Amen. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Meaning that this church, his message came to them, but they didn't take it serious. But he says that, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So I just pray these two church to help us know that Christianity is not about living anyhow. Like many have portrayed to many Christians. That's not what Christianity is about. It doesn't mean that when you just sin, then God will cut you out. No. There's forgiveness in Christ Jesus. There's room for repentance in Christ Jesus. God's grace is so abundant. But if God tells you repent, repent, and repent, the person is not repenting, a time will come. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 29. Says he that being often reproved, so we will reprove you. Like now he's reproving the church. Says change, repent. It's a reproving, it's a rebuke, a correction. But he says he that being often reproved and still hardens his or her neck shall suddenly be destroyed. Shall so that's why he says that if you don't repent, I'll come upon you as a thief suddenly. So you shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. So he said, God of love, and he will bring his warning because he that I love, I correct. But if the Christian goes on hardening the neck, hardening the neck, it comes to a point that he says, enough is enough. That part of grace too should be taught. So they don't teach that angle of grace too. It's not all about Go and do anything you want. Go and do anything you want. He loves you. He will forgive you. He says that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. But if such people, they don't, some people don't, who don't repent over time and they continue wallowing in sin, it comes to a point that says that I will come upon you suddenly and you shall be destroyed without remedy. So today, as you have heard the word of the Lord, you may be here. We are going to pray. We are ready here. And you want to say, Father, I want a restoration in my life. I want to make things anew in my life. You can come forward and I'll pray with you. You can come forward and I'll pray with you. If you want a restoration in your life, you will know that you are walking in a way which really doesn't glorify the Lord. But you want to make what? Uh, a change. 